So I think that's it. Uh, with that, we can go ahead and start today's webinar, Making the Case, uh, the Business Value of Observability. Uh, so with that, hi, I'm George Miranda, uh, Head of Ecosystem and Partnerships uh, here at Honeycomb, one of the co-authors of our book. And uh, I'll just go counterclockwise, or counterclockwise on the screen. So Charity, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, Charity Majors, uh, CTO um, and co-founder. Uh, and I'm tweeting about this right now before we get started. Hi, I'm Liz Song Jones. I'm a principal developer advocate at Honeycomb, and I previously was a SRE at Google. So I'm very excited to be uh, to be talking about this subject. It's very near and dear to my heart. Yeah, and I'm I'm really glad to see uh, the the three of us back together for this this last episode. We. Uh, have sort of alternated, like we haven't all been here for all of the episodes and sometimes we've had guests, um, but I think this is a really appropriate way to uh, wrap up this series. So uh, in case you haven't joined us before, uh, I just want to catch you up on how things have been happening and how things are going to work in this uh, particular episode. Um, so this is the last session in our Authors Cut series, right? And the idea with this series um, was to go in depth, right, with takes that we couldn't necessarily fit into the book, um, and to also show you how the concepts that are in the book are implemented using real world examples. And I think what I like about this series is that what we've gotten is, is like one part book club, uh, one part free form discussion, uh, like one part guest speakers, right? And then like one part live demo. Um, so this is the last session in our series. And like I've said before, this is gonna be pretty different from some of the others. So let's recap what we've done so far. Um, in episode one, uh, we started at chapter five of the book, and we went so late into the book uh, as a way to start because we wanted to ground this series in concrete technical definitions. Uh, so we looked at arbitrarily wide structured events uh, and why they are the building block that is necessary to achieve observability. Um, so we talked about the need to capture high cardinality and high dimensionality data, and we looked at why all of those concepts are key fundamental requirements. And then in episode two, we went back to the beginning of the book um, to talk about how observability and monitoring are different. Uh, we cut through the hype, or at least I, ho I hope we cut through the hype of the term observability um, to get into concrete functional requirements, right? In other words, uh, if your debugging practices look like this, you know, that's monitoring. If they look like that, it's observability. Um, and and uh, that's basically all in, you know, how and when you use telemetry data to decide how and where to act on your systems. Um, and then in episode four, we made that like hyper-specific and concrete, right? We went in to demonstrate the core analysis loop. Right? And there we looked at how you examine that high cardinality and high dimensionality data, how you use those white events to determine the likely causes of, of any performance anomalies in your system that you care about. Uh, and because that it's a repeatable process, uh, then we show how that can be automated. Um, and we, and in our example, right, in our demo, we showed uh, Honeycomb's bubble up and how that happens in that implementation, though that's certainly not the only way to do it. Um, and from that, right, and from seeing functionally how that analysis loop looks, like what that investigative pattern is, um, from that, uh, we get a set of functional requirements, right, observability must operate these ways in order to support that kind of investigation. So we use that to dive deep into the requirements of building a data store that supports observability workloads. Uh, and then, right, along the way in this series, we've looked at several implementation use cases. Uh, episode three goes deep into uh, how SRE teams can implement observability and how it changes practices. Uh, in episode five, we looked at evolving team practices and what it means to develop your software with observability in mind from the start. So we were looking at how observability changes both uh, practices on, on ops and platform teams uh, and, and how it changes practices in development teams, right? And how your daily habits uh, shift along the way. Uh, then we also looked at specific use cases in depth, right? Episode six focused on SLOs or service level objectives uh, how they're used and why and why they're better when driven by observability data. Uh, episode seven focused on using observability in the software supply chain, uh, which is a fancy way of saying uh, that observability gives you an amazing way to troubleshoot your CI/CD 
infrastructure and delivery pipelines. Uh, then episode eight looked at how we manage observability at scale, both through practices like sampling and the use of telemetry pipelines. And in each of those episodes, um, we had an associated demo, right? Or we had a dive into architectural specifics and an analysis of how the different pieces uh, were assembled from a technical perspective to make the behavior that we're talking about possible. And we do that in every episode because it makes the material that we're discussing less abstract, right? It makes it more concrete. Um, and it makes it easier for, for you, the viewer, hopefully to dive in and, and sort of understand the nuances of the material that we're covering, right? Um, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, um, but in our case, it's more like a, a demo is worth two to three book chapters. Um, and so that's how all of these sessions have gone so far, right? Like we cover the topic with mouth words uh, and maybe some slides, right? And then we show you like, what does that mean in practice? Uh, and so that brings us to the last episode in the series. Uh, the business value of observability. Um, this, this episode covers book chapters 19, 20, and 21. Uh, and because the systems that we manage are socio-technical in nature, uh, in the last section of the book, we really focus on the socio part of the problem, right? How do you solve the people and culture problems that are necessary when making the shift to adopt observability practices? And so I would argue, I don't know how my co-authors feel about this, but I would argue that this part of the problem is much harder to concretely quantify. Um, I, I think we do a pretty good job of it, though I would love to hear from you all if you think we do or not. Um, uh, and so when thinking about what are, how are we gonna cover this one? Like, what do we have to show? Uh, we had two choices, right? Either uh, we could regurgitate a number of like the things that are in the chapters of the book, uh, which is a good option. And I think there's a lot more that we could cover in terms of context or experience, you know, things that we've seen, um, you know, patterns that we suspect are emergent, you know, and, and maybe some opinionated things that we couldn't put in the book. Um, or two, right, um, we could try to make these things concrete with some actual real life use cases uh, and analysis on the spot. Um, so I think that's what we're going to try. Uh, so in this session, we're going to turn the tables a little bit. And we are asking you, our audience, right? Everybody in attendance um, to tell us about your use cases, to tell us about the things that you're struggling with, right? Tell us about the challenges that you are facing. Uh, and then we can walk through uh, how the concepts in chapters 19, 20, and 21 uh, apply to the problems that we're grappling with, right? And so it's, how do you make a business case for observability? Um, how do you find stakeholders and allies that support your adoption or can help bolster your efforts throughout the organization? Um, and then an observability and maturity model. Like, where is this going? How do you know that you're doing it right? Um, so with that, um, let's dive into today's content. I don't know, Charity, Liz, anything else that you want to add to that? Mainly, I wanted to add is that basically, um, in you know, I'm a musician. I play the I play pl classical piano, and this is kind of what we would call like a masterclass, right? Like, we want to hear from you. We want to kind of coach you and walk you through kind of some of the challenges you might be facing with making the business case for observability in the hopes that it might be educational to some of the other people listening in, right, to see how that might apply to their own situations. So, you know, this is very much like, you know, not scripted. We want to kind of do a version of what people would get when they would come to my office hours, right, except for kind of, you know, open to uh, people to take away interpretations and kind of lessons they can learn for themselves. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm hoping to hear also, like, you know, from our from our attendees, you know, if, if those of you who have been successful at rolling out observability in your organizations, like, what do you think was key to your success? I'd love to hear that as well. Do we have a scenario to start with? Do and um, we we asked uh, for some scenarios in advance, and I unfortunately I don't have this person's name. I have their email address, but I don't really want to share that publicly. <laughs> Um, uh, so the, the, the question is, um, what's the most likely to succeed path from everybody is getting paged constantly, uh, to using SLOs or service level objectives, meaning, uh, do you suggest constructing an org that actually cares about, uh, oh, sorry. Meaning the question is for clarification, how do you suggest constructing an organization that actually cares about getting from A to B? 
So how can you get your organization to care from going from everybody is constantly getting paged to using SLOs and, and shifting on you know, the, the things that you're alerting on? If people are getting paged all the time and they don't care about making it better, I'm not sure what to do with that, honestly. Um, but and I think that most often the case is not that they don't care, it's that they don't have hope. They don't actually believe that it can be better. And yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and which is where, you know, uh, and honestly, this this comes up over and over again, especially when I'm talking to people about, you know, CICD or co continuous deploy deploys and like, you know, deploying quickly. And like, there are so many things where people just don't seem to think that they deserve nice things, right? Or, or like they, they they feel, it feels like they, they're like, well, how the Googles of the world get that? Or, but we don't get, or my, my coworkers aren't the kind of engineers who are, you know, or, or even I'm not the kind of engineer who's good enough to achieve these things. When that's really, really backwards because uh, none of these things are really hard. Uh, you ju they just take a little bit of time and attention and engineering, right? And, and it's, it's not the kind of thing where you have to get all the way to 15 minute deploys or less in order to like see value. You see value every time you remove a flappy alert, every time that you move to a single SLO, every time that you shrink the amount of time it takes to like build and deploy your software, every, every bit of progress that you make. Um, compounds in the time that it gives back to you and the and the brain cycles that it gives back to you and the trust that it builds with your colleagues uh, that things can get better. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, Liz and I have talked about this a lot and it's like, it feels like these ideas spread. Everybody knows the how it should be, but it's like, it only spreads by engineers who have, who have been there and seen that and seen how easy it is. And they bring the confidence with them to their next job. And they're like, no, all right, y'all, we can actually do this. It's not that complicated. And it feels like that's how progress gets made. Um, Liz, do you yeah. want to the main thing that I would share is, so I used to work as a, a customer reliability engineer on Google Cloud, and we had a number of Google Cloud customers that would come to us for help and basically be like, help, we're getting paid, you know, 50, 60, you know, 100 times a day. And what we always advise them to do is, you know, you're never going to be able to bur and bury yourself from that. In fact, you're probably not investigating 50 to 100 alerts a day, right? If you're not even investigating them, why are you letting them kind of take up space in your head? how can we help carve out time that's protected for you to work on SLOs or work on automation or kind of work on proactive rather than reactive efforts? So that kind of where is where it starts is you have to have some amount of leadership buy-in for the idea of protecting people's time from this onslaught of alerts so that they can kind of start adapting. I think one of the ways to make that concrete is uh, something that I would rely on a lot during my consulting days, right, which is uh, running experiments in parallel, right? So you don't change, I guess, the, the, the current way that you're doing alerts in this case um, for a majority of the organization. And then you take some slice of uh, your services or a thing that you're monitoring, or like even, you know, I guess in the case of SLOs, right? Just really caring about like the, the top level, you know, uh, user experience that you want to ensure. And like, don't touch any of your learning uh, infrastructure. Set up SLOs in parallel and then let it go, right? Uh, watch what happens when uh, you know you get that flood of alerts um, versus what happens when you get paged uh, by an SLO burn alert, right? And like, what is that responsive experience like? Uh, to Liz's point, right? Um, what are you doing with the alerts that you get, right? What are you doing with the onslaught of things that you may or may not be investigating versus is there a tangible, better way of doing it, right? And I think to Charity's point earlier, right? Often it's that organizations don't think there can be a better way. And the best way to show that is side-by-side -side comparison, right? This is what it looks like in today's world because it's still running. And here, like your experience could be like this parallel thing that I've set up over here, right? And then just over-communicate that, be very clear about that and show your stakeholders and you know your, your, your business allies um, what is tangibly better. Right? And like that, that side by side proof tends to be fairly indisputable, right? And then it, at that point, to, to the question, uh, you know, if if you don't care about going from A to B, right, then then your organization just just doesn't care. But that, from your side, is I think the the most uh, tangible way to to make that um, that difference clear. Uh, this question had a second part, which is. 
uh, this actually may be multiple questions, but let me read the whole thing. Are there some specific ways or use cases that you found that work in getting managers of managers into observability tools uh, on, an, on some sort of cadence, right? Is, this, is it worth trying to do that? So is it worth trying to get managers of managers into your observability tooling? Uh, and the, the question goes on to say, I've had some success in driving organizational clarity, meaning uh, whose teams own X that VPs have ended up using directly. Um, oh, I see. So there is data in your observability tool that can be useful to your business stakeholders, but is it is it more trouble than it's worth to try to get them into your observability tooling? Um, I think that really varies, right? Like definitely the first consumer of observability tooling is engineers who are trying to debug problems and kind of be in constant conversation with their code. Um, kind of that higher abstraction level so that your stakeholders don't get mired in the weeds is kind of, right? Like this is why Honeycomb offers an integration with Grafana, right? Like so that you can kind of create these executive level dashboards that are going to be higher level with the understanding that you can jump into and dive into Honeycomb, right? Like if you're an engineer and so that the executives can understand that it's backed by real source data, but yeah, right? Like you kind of, you know, if it depends on how many layers of management there are, right? Like, you know, Charity, I don't know, kind of, right? Like Honeycomb is a relatively small company still, right? Like you enter, you can interact with Honeycomb, right? Like, but at a much larger company, I could see a CTO or CIO kind of not wanting to yeah. necessarily get into the weeds. It, it's often, you don't want them jumping into the weeds, right? Because that that's when everybody's like, oh God, they're looking at the details again, right? It's, it's kind of not their job to do that. But but again, there's not really a, a single right answer here. Like some are more technical than others. Some get a lot of joy out of doing that. Most don't. And most, I think, really kind of want the aggregates. Where I think that um, it could be valuable is is making sure that they understand the value of it and how it's different, though, because this is a way that observability is different from the tools that have come before. And sometimes executives are like, ah, they look like the same old dashboards. I don't want to pay, you know, blah, blah, blah for something. Um, and I think it is important to, to get at least get them on uh, on board in so far as they understand what is different and what it is they're buying. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this from a, from a different perspective, and I, I may be that technical user that you're talking about, Charity, right? But I so at Honeycomb, I I run the business development portion of of what we do, so like partnerships and integrations, right? And uh, I I use Honeycomb to look at. Um, Different uh, different bits of telemetry, like where, like so, I, we end up parsing HTTP headers to look at user agent to figure out uh, where where did this telemetry come from? Is it from an open telemetry SDK? Is it from an integration that somebody's built, right? And and so in in my case, it actually really helps me to understand, you know, which integrations are used, um, like what experiments do we roll out, and uh, and and were they successful, right? Um, are people using them? Is this integration worthwhile? Who is it worthwhile to? Is it um, is it useful for people that already are interested in observability, like already are an existing customer, and this is just additional stuff they want to know? Or is this really useful to new users, right? Like, does this help you see the value of observability very quickly, right? And for me personally, um, I am able to go through and sort of ask questions that I want of you know, how integrations into our product are being used. And, and I get to poke around and, and figure out one, what can we see? Two, if we can't see something, how do we make that visible? Uh, and, and three, really get to explore questions around usage, what's important to the business, and do we have real data to show that? And for, for us on the, on the integration side, it has really changed how we think about go-to-market relationships because we can run very easy, simple to you know uh, uh, support experiments, and then figure out do people find this useful, right? And that sort of data on the executive side is immensely powerful. Uh, so I I love having that available, and I think if I was not comfortable with our observability tool on my team, if I had at least somebody that when I had questions like that could show me and like do the work or like you know. Uh, like put together the queries or put together the views and then kind of walk me through what's possible, uh, I would find that invaluable, right? So, so I, go ahead. I, I feel like um, kind of what, what I'm starting to hear and, and the answer to this 
peering back at me here is that um, often execs and, and other people and elsewhere in the business do have a real need for this information, but they end up getting it in a different way. Like they'll end up buying yet another tool or they'll yeah. end up slapping, you know, a, a you know, business logic, you know, so they'll, they'll put something else, in, you know, in the, and, and what, what I think is beautiful about observability and, and what makes it a good long-term investment is that you can kind of start to curb that, that tool sprawl of just like, everybody needs a different fucking tool for the way they see the world, because you have a source of truth that can be sliced and diced. You can get all the insights that you need out of it for whether you're an ops or dev or biz or marketing. We've had some of our most passionate users have been product people, you know, they're like, this is a amazing because you can literally get you can ask any question you can understand what's happening from any of these perspectives um and and you don't like have to like set up yet another source of truth um and i think that this I think the main thing more... is that it's this alignment right of business value to uh to to understanding of your systems and cardinality is kind of the key to unlocking that right like everyone cares about user experience even if they don't necessarily know to experience to express it in the words of cardinality and observability and I think that this is going to become more and more compelling as, you know, as Honeycomb and, and the other observability tool, Lightstep, get even more powerful and, 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 and develop better and better UX uh, experiences for people who are used to seeing things in a different way, like from the front end perspective, from the back. Right now, there's just kind of the one way of querying in the dashboards. But, you know, if we can bring build on different sort of skins and, and ways to like see it that, that resembles the world they're used to, um, then that 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 frees you up from having to pay for more and more tools. Cool. I I, I see we have another question. So uh, maybe let's, yeah, that's let's a move great on to one. that one. So uh, yeah, Samuel, why don't you ask Samuel and you? Yeah. yeah, happy to. Um, I'll try and say it differently than I've typed, but um, I think the thing I'm trying to get across is from where we work, we've got lots of systems, we've got metrics and logs already. And we get by, we're not doing too bad. Yeah. Um, we're not in a place where there's a pressing desire to, to change everything so that we can kind of free ourselves up in the long term. Um, but it's very clear to me, yeah, by adopting something like open telemetry and introducing a measure of quality per service would be useful for us across a number of different teams, uh, which is something we just don't have at the moment. So teams understand their own things, but across the board, that's not very consistent. Um, so I'm trying to think, how do I get from where we are to uh, somewhere where we do have um, tracing and where we do have SLOs for services? Um, but it's hard when uh, we're doing all right. This is, this is such a great question. Yes. We spend so much time like sort of talking to people who are in crisis because typically those are the people who are motivated to make changes, right? Um, but you are in the position of being able to make long-term investments. This is the world that most people are trying to build towards, right? And so the answer is not don't make long-term investments. The answer is, yay, we're in a position where we can we can choose the right investments to make. And, and so like, I think that what you need to do is start like assembling. And I think that there are, are lots of really compelling arguments for, for why this is a great um, long-term in, investment. I, I will not hog the mic though. <laughs> Yeah, I think the pain point that you're coming up, uh, across, uh, Samuel, is basically this uh, idea that, you know, yes, if everyone understands, you know, from knowledge of their own service, what's going on with their own service, kind of that next step is how do you onboard engineers faster, right? How do you need people not to necessarily kind of accumulate all of this collective knowledge about their one service? And how do we enable people to kind of be able to self-service reaching into other services, understanding kind of how your upstream and downstream interact, right? Like when you're in existing in an environment of many different microservices, no problem is kind of confined to one single microservice, right? So kind of decreasing coordination costs can be really helpful. Right now, people are debugging from way too much intuition. They're debugging from, they're, they're using their knowledge as that sort of like connective tissue to like map this, this, you know, this metric to that metric and all this stuff, which doesn't scale. And it breaks down when new and interesting things happen, right? Ideally, you want people to be able to like, to debug, e debug it quickly, even when it's the first time you've ever seen it or when it's something completely new or if they're relatively new to the company or if they're debugging in a different part of the stack, right? This gives engineers the ability to go from one part of the system to another part of the system and, and you know, be able to function and, and ask things without all of that local knowledge. Um, it's also, 
uh, like you kind of made, you, you already kind of said a lot of this, but like these things build on each other, like using, using SLOs, SLIs, like, um, there's a lot of energy and maintenance that your team is sinking right now into it, you know, you, you've got a leaky boat. It's just, you're, you're paddling quite well, you know, and you've got a whole pumping system, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a good job. You have enough resources, but what if you didn't have to keep pumping all that water out of the boat all the time? What would you do with those extra cycles? If you could, you know, and I bet that there are a lot of things that are currently wrong with your system that you just don't know about because you don't have the ability you just don't, like we see this all the time. Every time somebody rolls out observability, they're like, oh, wow, that's happening. We didn't know about that. Oh, wow, that bug is there. Like, there's just no, the only way that you're currently finding bugs that don't trip the, um, the alert, like the alerting mechanism, which is a high threshold to hit. The only way that you're finding bugs is by customers telling you about them. Observability allows you to find those anomalies and find them in advance of customers tripping over them. I love what Charity said also about kind of being able to um, move, you know, move between different parts of the stack, right? That gives people internal flexibility to change teams. Certainly one of the things that I experienced while I was, you know, people are like, you know, oh my God, like you were at Google for 11 years. That's a long time, isn't it? And I was like, you know what? I only spent 12 to 18 months on any one individual team. Like, um, and part of how I was able to do that was I learned the common tooling and kind of the common first principles debugging. So I didn't need to accumulate a lot of that kind of shared knowledge in my head because I was able to apply it and kind of freely transfer between different teams, knowing that I would be successful at any of them. Um, cool. Any follow-up, Samuel? Also, like the thing about the um, hotel in particular, as I'm sure you know, like the goal is that, you know, you ever, nobody wants to go through and re-instrument their code. But the thing with the hotel is this should be the last time anyone has to re-instrument their code because we're all committed as vendors, you know, to all except data dog. That's another story. We're all committed as vendors to, to making it so that people can like, you know, try out different vendors and not have to re-instrument your code. So if you think you might ever want to add or change vendors, it's great to get that out of the way now and just like start contributing to the community, start. I mean, you you guys at the Financial Times are known for being a really great community member and it would be really sweet to have you on the hotel bus. I'm hoping we get there too, actually. Very much, that's how I see the project. Um, I think that's given me a lot of thought. So thank you very much for all that. Uh, we have we have this question uh, from Rob in the chat. It says, uh, out of curiosity, the business argument to leadership seems very similar to arguing over development priorities, uh, like which new features, bug fixes, or tech debt you're going to get to first, um, uh, doing that via JIRA. So the question is, uh, does our team apply any observability principles to uh, the product management and development lifecycle? Uh, and then there's a follow-up, you know, it might be overkill, but uh, what would you do if we could pipe Jira ticket metrics into Honeycomb? Oh, that one's, I know Charity is excited about that one, about kind of the door metrics and kind of getting kind of uh, engineering team productivity in Honeycomb. Yeah, sorry, I was busy getting excited over what Elvis just said in chat, so I'm catching up here. <laughs> um, what would you do if you could pipe your ticket metrics into Honeycomb? <laughs> I, I think the, the question is here, right? Um, uh, how do we use observability to uh, uh, prioritize feature development, right? Um, or, or do we, like, how does, how does that influence uh, our product management or uh, development lifecycle? Yeah, that's a really great question. I wish we had Philip here right now. Philip would be the one who would really answer this. But my, my, my impression is that we use it less in terms of like, you know, we don't use Jira, by the way, so we don't have any Jira tickets. Um, and our product, our head of product, Megan, is very, she, she's a religious zealot and we love her for it. But she, she's just like, she has interest. She, she's like no story points, do any of that stuff. But where we do use our product is for like really, really closely. Are people using this? How are they using it? This thing that we built that, you know, these, it really helps us run experiments, you know, because we have this very granular data and we can, we can see how the experiment is going. It, it allows us to be just in this, you know, constant conversation with what is actually going on. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah. We're, 
kind of not at a size, at least at Honeycomb ourselves, where, you know, Jira ticket metrics and print velocity can be usefully tracked with a heat map. Um, but the thing that we can usefully track with a heat map is number of builds, um, number of builds, yeah. times those builds, right? Like accelerating the time that your build takes from, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes to 10 minutes, right? Like we say 15 minute builder bust at Honeycomb, we really mean it, right? Like, and we have the detailed heat maps that kind of broken down and traces broken down by steps that we can keep that cycle time low. So I think that's kind of the main place where we apply observability principles to our development life cycle. Yeah, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm unmuted or not. Sure. Go for it. Yeah, we can mute. Okay. Um, so just, uh, this is Rob, uh, just following up on that. Uh, what ticket management system do you guys use? Uh, it's it, it would be surprising to me if you didn't use one. Um, we use Asana. But, uh, 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 Asana? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, Asana for tactical work and ProdPad for product management. So anytime you give one of us or one of our product managers feedback, um, that goes into ProdPad for kind of longer term prioritization, unless it's like an obvious bug. Okay. Yeah. Um, coming from uh, one startup, so, you know, mostly SaaS startups as well. Uh, we would often, you know, onboard new customers, uh, clients, banks, uh, where they would request new features for our product. And, you know, those promised sales features would have to make their way to development. Um, and then we'd have to deliver by some amount of time. Um, and usually that's kind of difficult because it's, it's, it's asking you to interrupt whatever you have planned with new incoming work. Um, kind of, you know, going towards um, some of, uh, well, I guess, you know, I'm not too big on SL, so I'm just still researching, but, you know, capacity and utilization uh, metrics around that and, you know, deadline um, planning as well. Um, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. everything that has to do with measuring how engineers and product and design do, do work, everything is so fraught, like everything's a problem, and yet you can't have nothing. <laughs> Right. Um, but like anything that you start measuring, you're going to start like working to. And so like my my philosophy with that is, is that if you're going to use metrics and, and you got to use metrics at some point, you know, you got to be able to tell at least the direction of are we getting better? Or are we getting worse? Where's our time going? Um, I my philosophy is don't just have one. Right. Try to have a basket of metrics that you pay attention to rather than tracking really closely. Right. Like don't check in on every week because there's good. You don't want people optimizing for that on the week, every week, like, even things that seem innocuous, like the time it takes, you know, from when it's from when a bug is filed to when it gets fixed. You know, if you're tracking that and if you're saying short is good, long is bad, um, that's just going to, you know, incentivize people to not take on the really gnarly bugs that might be mission critical, but might take two months to fix. Right. Um, so you really don't exactly. want to we've kind of had a slew of those recently where we keep on applying kind of the minimum viable hotfix and eventually kind of our hotfixes uh, culminated in uh, the outage that we just published a retro a postmortem of, uh, I think, like three weeks ago. So, yeah, there are kind of limits to what you can do with kind of maximizing cycle or minimizing cycle time. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a problem with everything you're going to me measure. So measure a few things. Right. Um, and uh, I don't think that we pipe most of those things into Honeycomb because they're very nascent. They're very like back of envelope for us at this point because um, we are very young and very early and we don't need a lot of overhead. Let's take Chris's question, which I think sort of builds on this, uh, which is which is more about the things that you would measure. Um, so the question is, uh, if we have business case metrics to help frame the improvements that organizations see after implementing observability, for example, X percent improvements in MTTD, quality of service, availability improvements, et cetera. So I guess uh, on that note, Charity, like what should you measure? So Liz and I wrote up this whole thing about the observability maturity model a while ago, which I think is relevant here, even though we haven't really super invested in it, um, because it, it's not like plug in observability, watch this number go up, right? It's more like, all of these things, um, you know, it, the the time to delivery, uh, the the number of times that things go down, the time it takes to recover, that you know, all of these things they they reinforce each other. It's not like you work on one to the exclusion of the others. It's like you improve one and the rest improve, you know, and 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 it's all kind of a virtuous or a, or a, <laughs> or a not so virtuous um, cycle. Um, so, like the way I think of it is less. What, what improves when we observe when we implement observability and more um, no, not more met, which metrics improve and more like how much easier are what how does our improve, ability to execute improve um, because 
you know, a lot of people will be like, ah, I expect the number of bugs to go down when we implement observability, when in fact, suddenly they're surfacing more bugs than ever before, because now they can see ones that they could never see before, right? And so that's a good thing, even though on the graphs it looks bad. Um, Charity, this is this is your cutest to talk about mean time to WTF. Uh, yeah, something that we talk about a lot is the MTT, MTT WTF is just like the, the mean time to when you're able to figure out what the fuck is going on. And that should go down a lot, like a lot. And, a not, lot. and not just like finding out WTF is going on, but also like discovering new WTFs that you didn't even know about, that you didn't even think were going to be problems. Yep. Both of those things. Um, yeah. In fact, you know, we it's the story that we hear again and again and again from from our users is how, like, just the other day, somebody pasted in a chat. Someone who was like, "I threw three engineers at this problem for a better, better part of a week, and we we turned honeycomb on it for twenty minutes, and and we found the problem." Right? It's 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 like magic, like at, at finding these outlier or the things where like something is broken because all five of these rare things happen to happen at once. So if you look at any of the metrics in isolation, they all look fine, but together, like they're they're a, they're a nightmare. Um, and when something was bubble like bubble up, it's like you know, you just look at the graph, <laughs> draw, draw, pick, draw a circle on the part of the graph that hurt you, right? Like, and, and point to it. And then, and then we pre-compute for all of the dimensions, both inside and outside. Then when we diff them and sort them, so you can see all of the things that are different about the thing that you care about. And that is usually like, it, you, you're just jumping to the end of the book right there and you've got your answer very often. So uh, to, to put a finer point on, on Chris's question, I think there are a couple of areas of improvement, like the, the typical use cases that we see, like, like where observability can really help. And so they, they all kind of do center around that, that mean time to, to, to BTF, right? Which is incident response, right? Something breaks and you need to figure out what, right? And so like any of the associated metrics around that, like observability can help, but basically, right? Find the root of your problem faster. Um, uh, uh, being able to uh, 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 make performance improvements, right? Like there is some unexplained slow part of your stack. Like, where is it? How do we, how do we surface it? Right. To charity's point, finding all the hidden bugs that are causing very, very slow performance. So ultimately, right. What that means is creating more resilient and performance services, right. Uh, observability can help there. And then, uh, shipping features reliably, right. So, and we really talked about this during, uh, like the whichever webinar episode it was around uh, observability during development, right? If you have observability in your applications and you release in a progressive delivery pattern, right? And like expose this new feature to a subset of users and then watch that performance to figure out what is this new feature doing? Is it behaving the way that I expect, right? Then you know early whether to, uh, you know, ro roll back or like that feature isn't working as you expected or whether it's safe to continue to deploy. Right. And so ultimately what you're getting is fewer failures when you deploy um, or, or sorry, uh, not necessarily fewer failures, but you know, earlier, right. Before yeah. it's customer impacting. And so like in those three areas are where we usually see the biggest imp uh, improvements and performance. And when you are firing on all three of those, uh, it sort of like leads you in the direction of the Dora metrics, right. High performing teams ship faster, recovery from failures faster, right? Less time between commit and running in production, like all of those things. If you want to measure those, great. Like observability can really help you in those directions. Yeah. It really helps with both shifting left and shifting right, right? It helps like something that we talk about a lot is, you know, while you're developing, you add your, you add your instrumentation, then you deploy it. And then you close the loop by going and looking at it through the lens of the instrumentation that you just wrote and asking yourself, is the thing that I wrote, does, is it working as I expected it to? Does anything else look weird? And like, by looking at it and asking those questions of your, of your instrumentation, um, like that's where you can find like most bugs, right? right there while all the context is still in your head. Um, and, you know, if you don't have the ability to look at it with, with observability, you can't, you can't tell that. You can just tell an aggregate, does everything look fine or not, which is going to miss like 90% of all the bugs. And bugs, like the, the time, the, the cost of finding and fixing those bugs goes up exponentially from the moment that you write them. So the earlier that you can catch them, the better. It also helps with shifting right, meaning, you know, 
uh, testing and production, basically, um, in, a, in a rigorous and controlled way, where, where you know maybe you're deploying to a, a percentage of the host using feature flags or or a percentage of the users or, or something, and then you're actually like going and looking at it and seeing is my code doing what I want it to in a way that you know you're in the old days without observability, you basically, you can only tell again in aggregate if things are really good or really bad. Um, and if you think something might be wrong, you have to like take it over your to your development, development environment and try to replicate it, which might actually not be possible because most bugs will only surface in prod. Um, so like just being able to like take your microscope to production itself is also really helpful. I feel yeah. like that's- And in some cases, to... in in some cases, it can increase your, you know, notional. That's why we don't love the kind of mean time too, right? Like because, mm -hmm. honestly, I do love a long investigation, right? That results in a tangibly better outcome for a customer, even if you know I'm I'm trying not to optimize, you know, how, you know, what what even FTTWTF has its pessimal <laughs> as outcomes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, related, there's there's a question in the chat about uh, MTTWF, right, or MTTWTF, uh, and and how to measure that. But I think the the core of the question is uh, around honeycomb and how long it takes us to, um, to 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 get to that like what like WTF moment, right? And so uh, I, the the way that I would address this question is um, uh, Fred Hebert, who was uh, on the SRE. Uh, episode of this uh, webinar series uh, talked a lot about how uh, uh, Honeycomb's SRE team uh, uses Honeycomb uh, in, in the course of incident investigation. And I think at our last conference, he had a, a talk about incident investigation at Honeycomb. And I think what he really zeroed in on was that triage, uh, like time to triage and figure out like where is the source was very minimal, right? It was, it was, it was fairly uh, trivial, not in all cases, but a lot of the time to figure out where is this thing happening, and like like that process fast. <laughs> then the hard part starts of okay, why is it happening there? And that's where a lot of the expertise comes in, and that's where a lot of your familiarity with the code base comes in, right? Like observability, fi find the right thing, and then you know uh, <laughs> that the unpacking the WTF between then and when you fix it, right? That, depending on the issue that's happening, right? Can kind of be all over the map. Um, cool. There's one more question here. Estimated developer velocity is directly impacted by an organization's error budget. How does a possible elevator pitch go for requiring action to be taken uh, by blown SLOs or burndowns that will potentially go from zero uh, or beyond? Uh, meaning, I failed to clearly articulate this before in prior orgs. Uh, maybe I'm doing it wrong. So okay, so yeah. the Google SRE book says you should freeze all deploys when you hit zero error budget. Oh, we God. do not believe in that, right? Like we we think that that's overly prescriptive. That it kind of discourages people from using error budgets because it kind of then makes people go like, oh God, like I go from 100 miles per hour to stopping at zero miles per hour, right? Like. To us, it's more of a speed up, slow down, or like, you know, what risk containment measures are you using? Charity, you just said, oh God, what was your oh God? Oh yeah, the, the, I always forget that the Google SRE says that. And I'm like, God, that's just terrible all over again. Uh, yeah, so Jason, could you um, clarify for us maybe, uh, to me, like, maybe I don't understand the elevator pitch for doing work when you blow your SLOs, like, is that what you're saying? You need to persuade people to do things after you blow your SLOs? Yeah, so what, I, what I'm estimating or what I'm believing to be the process is that, you know, as your error budget is, is about to be blown or your SLO is about to be blown, and may, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but then that is, you're, you're close to this contractual obligation to your customer, right? So you, you as the uh, organization need to, you know, shift or shift your patterns of, of workload, yeah. right? And you need yeah. to do something so that you do not blow your, right. your SLO, right? So, um, and uh, I honestly, like, I feel like most organizations, or at least the ones that I've worked for, those contractual obligations are kind of a, um, we're trying to do it 
and we're, we're, we're going to get back to our That's contractual effort. Effort. <laughs> yeah we're trying to but if we blow through that all we care about is whether or not we're making money right now gotcha. are we are we yeah. making money and so maybe Ooh. like i'm concerned that like my surface area that i'm i'm looking at may be a little bit too uh too great like if if we're only concerned about a certain specific set of APIs, you know, maybe that's better to look at just a smaller well, this subset. Is the thing. Like you have to develop SLOs that you all agree to believe it. They have to have teeth, which means it can take a while to get to a place where you're like, and, and then it can change over time, right? But yeah, SLOs should not be something that are going off constantly. Like you could honey come like we 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 bake in that we allow ourselves like one reset per month or, or something like that, right? But like but like if they're going off constantly or if they're not getting paid attention to, then they're like, <laughs> what do you even have? Like, that's the whole point. Um, right. SLOs so, have to be meaningful APIs for your customers and for your engineering yes, you teams. You have to care about them. All right. I mean, I mean like, it, it can't be just an engineer in the back back room making up the SLOs, the entire organization right, right. Has, this to, has, to, okay. has to be like agreed upon by all the stakeholders, like product and, you know, sales and everybody involved, everybody who cares about this needs to look at and say, yes, I agree that below this level is not good enough. And if we're, if we're going to hit this level, all engines on deck, right? Like we we're going to avert this, this catastrophe. And if, if, if nobody cares about your passing your SLOs, then they're probably too, too strong. Yeah, or there are probably too many, too many like API endpoints that don't matter. Like we only have like three key SLIs here at Honeycomb and we really care about them. That being said, aspirational SLOs versus achievable SLOs, right? Like you want to set your SLOs that you page and alert on and that you kind of drive yeah. your day-to-day -day engineering decisions on should be based off of what's actually achievable. Mm -hmm. You might have separate aspirational SLOs that reflect system kind of as originally conceived and designed that you're kind of working to shore the system up towards. And all of these should be, you know, a little, you know, more aggressive than what your SLAs are, right? Like if your SLAs say that you're bleeding money, then you're bleeding money, right? Like, you know, you, you got to take kind of imminent action there. Um, yeah. So one last thing that I would add, I'm looking at the clock and we are, we are uh, running uh, close to the end of time. So we may have time for one more question, but a um, couple of things to, to cover in addition to some of the things that we've already talked about. Uh, uh, just remember, uh, Honeycomb values your feedback, and so if you complete a survey about this webinar before tomorrow at noon Pacific, we'll send you a t-shirt to say thanks. I think it's the iHeart Prod t-shirt, isn't it? It's pretty great. It might, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It's a, um, it's a good one. So there's a link in the chat as well where you can scan the QR code that's on the screen. Uh, and also, uh, there are a number of other events in uh, uh in, in honeycomb and this world. is our very last this is our very last author's cut so this is our very last wow. author's cut well. i know uh we've been at this for a while um but uh uh, uh jason to your point uh and to your question uh we often have a number of different workshops uh some of the ones that are on the screen are uh the ones that are upcoming in the past we have held an slo development workshop and a majority of that workshop is not actually about defining slis though part of it is uh, a lot of it is uh, how you sit down and have those uh, conversations with your stakeholders to make sure that you are getting that organizational buy-in. Because again, to your point, right, it can't just be a technical team sitting off in the corner and creating these things, or you're just setting yourself up for those conversations where, right, you, you have to have the hard conversation of, we need to stop and there's no business buy-in. Um, let's see, uh, do we have any other questions? I'm looking at the chat. Um, okay. Uh, Liz, Charity, given that this is the, the last uh, uh, episode in the Authors Cut series, anything that you want to add or say or any parting words? I think the main parting word is like, you know, I'm a big deliver a believer in continuous delivery and in kind of uh, in agile practice. So you know, just start by implementing some observability. Don't wait until you get it perfect, and then you know you'll reap more benefits. So you know, get started and then and then see how it goes. Yeah, uh, 
I I am just very grateful to have done this. I'm so glad that people showed up and seemed to find it interesting. And I learned a lot from the questions that you all have asked. So like Liz said, you know, this is a this is this continues to be a, a work in progress. It's never actually finished. Um, so we will continue using your questions and writing Ask Miss Ollie um, articles about them. And I hope that you'll continue to send us your feedback. Absolutely. And one of the things that I would add is uh, uh, chatting with folks over time. Uh, the Author's Cut series, I think, has been a good uh, supplement to some of the stuff that's in the book. Uh, so uh, hopefully, if you found this content useful, uh, the rundown in the beginning of this, the recap may point you at uh, places where we dive in uh, a lot further than we do in the book. Um, also, I want to point out uh, in the Pollinators uh, community Slack, uh, which is a Slack group that uh, is run by Honeycomb, we have a book club channel. So feel free to drop in with questions, we'll keep an eye out there. And again, uh, Ask Miss Ollie, the blog, uh, Office Hours with Liz and DevRel team. Uh, we've got a number of places for you to come engage us, ask questions, and we hope that you will continue to reach out um, as you uh, continue on your observability journey. So with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you for attending this series, and uh, we'll see you in one of those places. Hopefully, we'll hear from you soon. Thanks. Have a good day.